I think we're, I've been given the signal. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Aaron Metchen. I am uh, uh, giving today's talk on, it was just unraveling complexities, advanced diagnosis of complement media, TMA, and AAA HUS. I think just in interest of flow, unless there's a pressing burning question or I've made some sort of horrid mistake, I think we're going to keep uh, questions towards the end so that myself uh, and our other speakers um, will all have a chance to, uh, to answer all your questions. But um, I'm informal. If you've got a question, just raise your hand. Uh, but if not, you know, that need, if it needs to be answered right away. So let's get started. Uh, the obligatory uh, disclosures just, you know, for people with whom I've supported my research and for people whom I've consulted with. Um, and this will be just the top, uh, the outline of today's lecture. Um, so a quick little background. Uh, we'll start instead of on atypical HUS, a little bit on me. Um, yeah, I'm an adult benign hematologist. Uh, I was at the University of Colorado. Uh, so it's good seeing my old patients from there. Uh, and, now, and we'll start at Duke University where I focus primarily on hemostasis thrombosis and something what I consider is like immune hematology. So atypical HUS, TTP, ITP, and hemolytic anemias. Um, but um, just because I think we have a varied uh, spectrum of people who are here and people who are online, um, we're going to run the gamut of what this talk uh, it will entail. So for those who aren't aware, even though I think everyone here probably has had atypical HUS, this is what we call a thrombotic microangiopathy. And a thrombotic microangiopathy is a broad encompassing term where someone has thrombocytopenia, which are low platelets, and a specific type of anemia, what we call a microangiopathic or MAHA, where we see this form of destroyed, damaged red blood cell called a schistocyte. And usually we see some sort of end organ disease, can affect the brain, can affect the heart, but typically for complement mediated thrombotic microangiopathy, it tends to be, it tends to be the kidneys. And this can be caused by I'm sorry, this could be characterized either by this could happen suddenly, someone who's feeling well, gets a minor cold, a medication, then all of a sudden, oh, uh, fudge, something's wrong, or it can something that could happen chronically over the course of time. In certain conditions, we can see this in the newborn period, we see it in children, or we see it in adults. And this can be acquired, which means someone was perfectly healthy up until their 75th birthday, and then this happens or it could be something that, have, that is lifelong. And that's how we sort of can categorize uh, the different types of thrombotic microangiopathies. And so what we typically see, when we see someone with a thrombotic microangiopathy, there's a handful of lists that are running through our head. Could this person have X, Y, or Z, or do we need to start at A all over again? There are the usual ones that we think about, which are those tops, like atypical HUS or DIC, could this be related to drugs for someone? Let's, by drugs, we mean medication, not the street kind. Um, hemolytic uremic syndrome, which I'll talk about quickly, or TTP, which is happening a couple, you know, through those walls over there. The rare ones. Uh, this is the stuff I read about, and honestly, this is the stuff I have never seen. This is probably more my pediatric colleagues would be thinking about this first. But for today, we're going to be talking about everyone, the favorite of everyone in this room is atypical HUS. So let's get started with that. And if you've seen the reason why, and we'll talk about this, you know, from the doctor or science point of view, it's no longer, you know, we, we, we want to call this what's called complement mediated thrombotic microangiopathy, just because we have learned so much more about this within the last 10 years, let alone the last five years. But what does this stem from? And this is for the people in the room or in the, or online who are just learning about this. This thrombotic microangiopathy is, call, is caused when there is an overactivation of this part of the immune system called complement. And this is what it looks like. And this is what we, we put this up to torture medical students, give them nightmares, and that they have to learn this. But there are three separate pathways. This, I don't have a laser. Um, you know, the alternative classical and lectin pathways that they all converge to this part called the membrane attack complex. Now, literally what the immune system is doing is punching holes in cells, whether it's virally infected cells, cancer cells, into bacteria as a way to 
kill what is, quote, foreign to the body. And for many people, 99.99999% of the time, this works just fine. We never notice, we never feel this until it doesn't work. And that's where disease comes in. And specifically for atypical HUS, this is the part that is abnormal. From the beginning, at the top, I need a laser. Um, that, <laughs> that F, B, and C3, that thing at the very top, that is always on. That is always on. It's called in the literature, what's called tick over. It's ready. It's ready. It's ready to go. I tell my patients, think of this as though the pit bull that, that is collared to a chain that's staked into the ground. It's ready to go. It's ready to attack at any moment. And the alternative pathway is controlled by these other, by other factors, which we'll get into, that are always putting the brakes on, always putting the brakes on, always putting the brakes on. And because there is a defect in the control of this pathway, this is why we call it complement mediated, because this is what causes the atypical part. We'll talk about that in a second. And the main factors are this thing, C5. This is what, and we'll talk more about this medication. This is what medications like ecoluzumab or ravulizumab are affecting. Or C3, something called peg c tacoplan And the newer medications that are coming out that are affecting like factor B, like iptacopan. So these are different areas that we can try to control, try to put the brakes back on this system. So since this pathway is always on, we have to keep, the body has to keep the brakes on. And then when it doesn't, that's when we see the end organ damage. And the, the proteins, the factors that are involved are like factor H, factor H like protein factor I, and others that are part of the break of the system. How does this go wrong? Well, people can have mutations in these genes in which the brakes are not working as well. Or someone can develop an antibody. Their own immune system can develop an antibody against things like factor H that prevent it from working. And we see this usually. And when there's a, what we call a, what we think is a second hit, although it could be a third, fourth, fifth, but we're not that smart. We're not that good. But what we consider a second hit, like medications or infections, that overwhelm the system and allow complement to go unabated. And so part of the process, we try to figure out, okay, is there a genetic component? And so you might see someone run what's called an NGS, a panel of all these genes. And as far as we know for now, knock on wood, these are all the genes that we know of, but we know that we're missing about 40%. But this is just a few list of genes that are involved in the control of the alternative pathway of complements. For those who, ha who don't have a genetic predisposition, there are some patients who have their immune system develops an autoantibody. Their own immune system is attacking the brakes on the system. For, for kids, we find out that this is associated with deletion in two of these genes, common factor H-related proteins one and three. And for adults, we tend to see this in those patients who already have an autoimmune disease. If they have something like lupus or antiphospholipid syndrome. So already we know that their body's primed towards attacking itself, so to speak. Now, what did this atypical come from? Well, HUS, hemolytic uremia syndrome, that the classic case, if someone was, if a patient had read the textbook, they went to, they had a hamburger that was contaminated with E. coli, O157H7, right? Jack in the box probably dating myself with that, right? <laughs> and they developed a bloody diarrhea. At the same time, they had thrombocytopenia, they had the schistocytes, and they had the kidney damage. That was hemolytic uremic syndrome. And for decades before, that was lumped together with TTP. And then, of course, we found out, no, the HUS is caused by a toxin from these bacteria, like E. coli or Shigella. And TTP is caused by a deficiency of ADMTS13. Well, what made it atypical was that these kids were presenting with what looked like HUS, but there was no history of them having a rotten steak or hamburger, and there was no bloody diarrhea. And that was the atypical part, which we now, which we now find is because there's this disorder, this dysregulation of complement. And generally, at that top part of that horrible pathway I showed you, that has been able to go unabated. The brakes have come off. And, the, and it's been able to uh, go, un, go completely activated. So let's talk about a typical case.
Now let me rephrase that. Let's talk about a case. None of these cases are very typical. So this is a patient that I saw, 53-year-old woman who had no real medical histories, having progressive and chronic vague abdominal complaints. One thing leads to another. She undergoes a CT scan eventually, and uh-oh, oh, geez, she has a right, she's got a mass on her right ovary. Turns out that that is a, that she has what's called a germ cell tumor. Um, it's, a ovary, it's an ovarian cancer. She sees her oncologist and they say, okay, there's a very classic treatment that you give for this. She's given this combination of chemotherapy. Everything goes fine. She feels fine. And when she shows up for her chemo the next round, I'm not going to repeat what was said, but holy smokes, was everything was wrong. This patient had significant renal damage, kidney disease. She had significant anemia. Her platelets are in the toilet. And that LDH is a marker of significant tissue destruction. Needless to say, all sorts of alarm bells are pulled because this should not be happening because this chemotherapy does not do this. What the fudge is wrong is the question that's being asked. <laughs> they throw her into the hospital and they call some, they call a hematologist and you know, where we do what we do. We take a look at her, we take a look at her blood and the microscope and we see these schistocytes and we say, uh oh, what the fudge is this? Now, if we're thinking this is probably atypical HUS or complement immediate TMA. But the reason I put that all the list of all those thrombotic microangiopathies that, that we're on, we have to make sure that this is not DIC, this is not HUS, this is not TTP, this is not drug induced, and this, or you know, could this be? complement media TMA. We check her Adam TS13, it comes back at 74%. So we know this is not TTP. And then we think, okay, this has to be, this most likely complement mediated. We start her rather quickly on ecolizumab. And because we're worried that the chemotherapy caused this, but she needs this chemotherapy. Well, we just kept her on ecolizumab for the course of her, for the entire cycle of her chemotherapy. When she under, when they, the chemotherapy downsized the size of her tumor, we kept her on it while she underwent her hysterectomy and removal of her cancer. And then we kept her on it for another six months. She completed chemotherapy without any evidence of recurrence. And then we stopped the ecolizumab and we held our breath. And five years later, she's not had a recurrence. Okay. Yes. Okay. Any questions so far? Stunned silence, yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, yes, ma'am. Do you know any just general percentages of how many genetically caused major adverse events that are more than um, so we would we tend to think that in adults, uh, and this is I I've left out a lot just in the interest of time and keeping people awake. Um, <laughs> you know, in the we we did send a, a panel. Uh, a genetic panel, and she, this patient did have a mutation in complement factor I, uh, but she only had one. So, class, so classically, we tend to think of like children, if they have two mutations, they're presenting in childhood, right? They present with the thrombotic microangiopathy, loss of kidney function, usually sometimes ending up on dialysis and needing a kidney transplant. For adults, there tends to be one mutation that for the majority of their life is perfectly fine. They're able to control complement. That 50% that's there works and works and works and works and works for years until that time when you give them chemotherapy or they get COVID or the influenza or they undergo massive surgery. And that 50% is not good enough. They needed 51% or 55% and complement just goes blows through that only 50% of the break. And for those patients, it becomes, and we'll, we'll get to that later, yes. But you know, we do find that there is a, that about 60% of these patients have a mutation in, their, in those genes. Now, which means either we found everyone that can, or more likely, we don't know what we have, we, we don't know what we don't know yet. There's still stuff, we still, there's still genes, pathways we still don't know yet that explain that other 40%. Did I answer your question? No. Okay. Well, well, we, so that's, 
just temper. That's a very rare amount. We see that much more in children who have combined CFHR1 and 3 mutations. But for our, pa other pa for our adult patients, they tend to be those who have underlying autoimmune diseases. So if they have a prior history of lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or antiphospholipid syndrome. We tend to see, we see it more in that patient population. But autoimmune atypical HUS is, is rather uncommon. So. So, um, we don't, to be accurate, we don't know because it's so rare in adults, but what happens in pediatrics? If you know about this quickly, we, we still start ecolizumab and immune suppression. In the beginning, while you're waiting for, let's say, ecolizumab to be improved or for them to get on vaccine, be immunized and get on antibiotic prophylaxis, you can do immune suppression in plasma exchange, trying to suck out that antibody against factor H. But if you give them a complement inhibitor, I don't want to say you can stop thinking, but you can stop thinking and you can like treat the complement activation. Okay. Good questions. Okay. So how do we diagnose? So we think about this when someone presents with a thrombotic microangiopathy that tends usually is associated with some sort of kidney damage. Someone that you knew a week, a month, a year ago had normal BUN and creatinine's normal kidney function. Now, all of a sudden, for no other reason, they've sustained significant kidney insufficiency. And usually what happens is people think, oh, this is TTP, because that's more common. Except you put them on plasma exchange and things aren't getting better. Or, you know, ideally, when you check the Adam TS13 in rut row, it comes back normal. Now, it's not unreasonable to do plasma exchange, because that does help. It does sort of keep it a little bit at bay. It's not the wrong thing, but it ain't the best thing. And while we know this is what can lead to it, genetic mutations, presence of autoantibodies, there's no rapid turnaround time. This isn't like a finger stick looking for someone's sugar levels. This can take weeks. So if we're thinking that this could be atypical HUS, it's what we call a clinico-pathologic one. We base our diagnosis of, is this atypical HUS by saying, look, here's what we think it is. Here's what we know it ain't. And even though it's gonna take us weeks to find out, look, we're using our best judgment in order to treat this person. And so this is not unlike many other of the treatments that we, many other conditions that we talked about. And there's a vital difference. If someone has atypical HUS, the treatment for that is complement control. If someone has TTP, the treatment for that is plasma exchange, immune suppression, caplicizumab. If someone has DIC, that is fixing the underlying con condition. If someone has what's called tumor lysis syndrome, it's giving chemotherapy. So the right diagnosis gets you the right treatment. The wrong diagnosis gets you the wrong treatment. Well, you could be getting the right one. So we, this is part of the process that we go through and think about what else could this be? if we see someone with a thrombotic microangiopathy and pronounced renal insufficiency, and the Adam chest 13 is normal, we're gonna go ahead and assume, let me rephrase that, we're gonna go ahead and be pretty confident that this is atypical HUS. And so this leads to immediate treatment. And like that says, immediate means immediate treatment. This is usually one of us yelling at pharmacy, screaming at insurance, saying that this is what the patient needs, this is what needs to happen. We know it's not TTP, we know it's not DIC, we know it's not from their tacrolimus, it's complement mediated. We start, the, we start complement inhibition as soon as we think this is possible. And the reason for this is the quicker we do this, the more likely we are to preserve renal function. And so what are the medications that are out there? This is the first one, ecolusumab. This is an antibody. That, is, that targets C5, the main where all the complement converges. It's made from a mouse and we give a standard dose and then we give a loading dose and then maintenance doses for at least six months. Ideally, since this is controlling, this is actually stopping complement, which 99% of the time is what we need. When we downgrade complement, people are very susceptible to meningitis. The type of meningitis that we see in college, dorms, military barracks, prisons. So ideally, we give 
we can do this ahead of time. But if not, we don't wait two weeks. We will go ahead, give the immunization, give the ecolizumab, and provide antibiotic prophylaxis. There's a longer acting version of this that has been approved for atypical HUS. And it's just the longer version of ecolizumab. Instead of a shot every two weeks, it's a shot, I'm going to phrase this, instead of an infusion every two weeks, it's an infusion every eight weeks. And it's just like ecolizumab, same warnings for meningitis. So they're basically about the same. We give a loading dose based upon weight and then a maintenance dose. And this is what, and this has been, this is more convenient, right? Most patients prefer an infusion every eight weeks instead of every two weeks. But we're never content to leave things the way they are. What else is out there? There is the, what's called OMS 721. This is another antibody that binds what's called the lectin pathway, the other side of that pathway, all the way at the top. And currently it has been used in transplant associated thrombotic microangiopathy, but it's currently undergoing a phase three clinical trial in patients with atypical HUS. Something that is, that is on the verge, it's an oral factor B inhibitor. So factor B is that guy way at the top. This is a pill twice a day. It's already used in another condition. It's already FDA approved for another condition called PNH. Um, and there's currently three phase three trials in atypical HUS. For those patients who walk in the door de novo with brand new diagnosis, those who are already on, and there's gonna be a long-term safety study. So for those patients who are getting sick of an infusion every eight weeks, or for some people who actually got to do that every six weeks, there's a, there's a chance you, might, you could just take a pill twice a day instead for your atypical HUS. Um, other th this was just, uh, just to show you that we're never happy with the way things are. There is something called semdisiran. Um, it's, what's, it's a novel method. It's called a small interfering in siRNA. Basically what you do is you give this compound, it goes into the liver and it works by, by making the liver to stop making C5. But the company said, eh, there's other things we want to invest our money. So the trial got terminated. Um, yeah, last but not, I'm Jay, look, I updated my slides. All right. Um, and of course there's a, a monoclonal antibody against what's called factor BB. Um, and this is set the, what's, this is still, um, this is only in phase two trials and what this is being bandied as being possibly better is that it just squashes the alternative pathway down without letting the rest of, of complement being, um, being inhibited. So the theory, which needs to be test driven is that this will lead to a less of a infectious risk than some of the other, uh, complement inhibitors. Okay. So hopefully by next year, we'll have an update on, you know, oh, I was wrong last year and here's how things have changed. So I think what probably a lot of people in here are probably getting to, okay, fine. I've had it. I've been treated, right? Now what? So at the very least, it's, you know, we continue. Um, what I would like to say is treatment for at least one year. The reason for that, we know that for some people who've had significant kidney injury, people who've been on dialysis, there can be a spontaneous recovery of kidney function up to one year. So I like to say, hurry up and wait. I know, I'm sorry, this sucks, but let's hurry up and wait for one year. Making sure that they are immune, vaccinated, protected against uh, meningococcus. So, oops. So making so when they've gotten their initial their initial immunizations, then every five years they get the first one, the men ACWY, and then the men B or the Bexero, uh, one year after, and then every two years after. Before, especially with our patients with PNH, you know, we did antibiotic prophylaxis with kids and we kind of uh, poo pooed it, shoot it away with adults. But one of the largest reports of patients, uh, largest reports, largest population patients with HWHUS from Canada showed that what the heck, the rate of meningitis infection, even for patients who have, were up to date on their meningitis infection, uh, vaccinations, was 550 times greater than the background. So the current recommendation now is that to do continued antibiotic prophylaxis along with immunizations. I brought this up with all my patients because this was relative, this was October, October of 23. 
Um, and most of my adult patients have told me, no, I don't think so. I'm not going to do it. Um, but it's something that I, every, every visit I say, Hey, you know, you know, you should do this. And they say, yeah, we hear you. We're going to do what we want instead. Um, now what everyone else is probably thinking, Frick, do I have to be on this forever? Okay. The unfortunate answer is it depends. It will depend. Um, we know that if it's a pediatric case and someone has homozygous, has two mutations, the answer is probably no. And by probably, I mean, it is not. Don't push me. Don't ask me. You can find someone who will agree with you. It ain't going to be me. If you have two mutations, you had this and you lost your kidneys when you were eight, I'm pretty confident what's going to happen when you're 12 or 16 and what's going to happen to the transplanted kidneys. They're gone. So that is a slam dunk. What do we do about someone who has only one mutation? Well, it depends upon what that mutation is in. Or what do we do to someone who, in whom we haven't found any mutations? Does it mean they don't have, they have none or we just have, or we're just not smart enough, good enough to know where we haven't looked yet. So there are, and I've trimmed several slides down in the interest of time, several, several retrospective studies. People have asked all over the world, many other countries, many other patients, do I have to be on this forever? And the general consensus, unless you have homozygous mutations, Probably not, right? That you can stop eclizumab. And a common theme, well, what do they do in France? What are they done in Italy? What are they done in Germany? What have they done in the States? Is that we have a talk. Look, how important is it you for you to remain on the infusions versus trying to stop, right? We look at where their kidney function's at. I don't know. Come on in. We look where their kidney function's at, where their laboratory parameters are at. And then we make a decision. And of all, you know, this is this is this is a what I'm going to present is something that's been published by the Hopkins Group, and it's it's what I think it's a very pragmatic approach. There's nothing proven, but it's something that just okay, this makes sense for those patients who don't have homozygous mutations. There, it's been six months to a year, right? There's no evidence of thrombotic at microangiopathy. Everything's good. Everything's been hunky and or dory. And what happened back then, look, oof, 2022, man, that was a crappy year for you, wasn't it? But look where we are right now. Should we continue? Should we stop, right? And if the patient says, you know what? I'm ready to go. We stop it, okay? And the upside is, okay, if we monitor, and this is what they do, and it's just as good as any. We check a CBC, kidney function, check urine, other places give the patient, some places give the patient um, a canister of the dipstick. Hey, once a week, piss into a cup. Do you have protein? Do you have blood? If you do, get back here ASAP. And the patient can do this at home, right? Oops. And they do this weekly, then twice a month, then monthly, then every three months. And this is how we monitor, right? If we stop it, we're not just going to say, oh, good. You're, oh, you want me to go back? You want me to go back to this? Do you do it? No. All right. And when, it also makes the slide available uh, to everybody on our website after publication, if that's requested. Well, it is okay with documentation. I'm like, that's not fun. This is more. <laughs> <laughs> no. Fine. I was going to do it, but now No one writes it down. They just take pictures, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Right. And I think the important part is we're monitoring, right? This isn't like a heart attack. It's not like a stroke. It's not like being struck by lightning, right? If there's going to be evidence of relapse, we're going to see it. We're going to see it early, right? And what we know is that, well, I'll get to that in a second, that this doesn't happen immediately. If someone has a pathogenic variant, right? It takes 9.5 person years. If there, we found something and we don't know if it's bad or not, it's like about 10 years, right? And no one who had a rare complement variant relapsed in 67 years. So what does this mean? We can watch. We have, in a certain sense, the luxury of time because many patients, right? It's been once bitten, twice shy. And what we know from many of these small studies is for those patients who relapsed, when you started the, when you started the complement inhibition, it stopped the process, right? And it was nowhere near as bad as the first time. So there is hope, right? As long as you're being regularly monitored, 
as long as people aren't ignoring the symptoms, there is hope to not only stop it, but if the bad question is, okay, what if it comes back? Okay, we do what you've been doing for the last year or two, back to the same. In a certain ways, it's no harm, no foul. We gave, we gave you a chance. I think that we gave you a chance to succeed. And with that, I'm done. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. I, I, I am unaware. The correct answer probably is I'm unaware of any time when it, it did not work again. Um, especially for atypical HUS, just at the risk of going over for PNH, sometimes C5 inhibition is not good enough. And we use other drugs, but for atypical HUS, if it's been, it's not like all of a sudden you became resistant to it. No. No. And then my other question would be then for triggers like, yeah. like COVID, et cetera. So are you monitoring more carefully when those things happen? Fantastic question. Yes. Um, monitoring and to be and to be honest, I'm doing that because I'm freaking out. My patient tells me I'm pregnant or I want to get pregnant right, right. or I need surgery. Or then I'm like, okay, then I'm gonna, hey, hey, you know, just to be sure parentheses, your doctor's freaking out. Um, come back in, let's test you. And around that time, I might torture my patient a bit more with more testing because that would be the time when they might get flicked over the edge. Um, so yeah, so, so with pregnancy, is it similar to immune-mediated that is the delivery that's the problem? That, it, it, or third trimester delivery tends to be the higher the, yeah. the highest risk portion. Um, but either way, since, you know, just be honest, I don't want to miss that. Hey, you're pregnant. Great. Good for you. <laughs> Why don't we do some more testing? Right. Um, just because you want to be able to, in, because, you know, so I tell, I'll tell my patients, look, healthy mom is healthy baby. Sick mom is sick baby. Dead mom is dead baby. When you see, you only have to say, how many times you have to see it before, you know, I mean, and the OB guys feel the same way, right? It, no one cares about the nine times out of 10, you're right. No one gives a crap about the 99 times out of hundred things work well. It's that one time when it don't, that's, that's, that's what your doctor remembers, right? I don't remember my successes. I only remember the failures. So, yeah. So that's why we, you know, during that time, they're like pregnancy and then around like surgeries or whatever. Then we do a little bit more. Now, along those lines, one of the things I do counsel, recommend, you know, educate my patients on for things that are, I think, that are routine. Look, your doctor wants to start you on a cholesterol pill, a high blood pressure pill. You want to start this diabetes medication. You look, you need a, you need, uh, you know, a mammogram. Get it done. Just because you had a typical HUS doesn't mean you have it now. Your past medical history is not your current one. Now, if someone's in the throes of an acute thrombotic migraine geopathy, then no, okay, all that other stuff can hurry up and wait. But there's no point in surviving atypical HUS for someone to die from like, oh, I was worried about it, so I didn't get a flu shot. Well, then what the, you know, you're more likely to die from that than you are from your atypical HUS. Okay, clear as mud? Yes, ma'am. Depends. It would depend upon the surgery. If you're, if someone's like, look, I need my, my shoulder's been killing me. I need arthroscopy. No, you do, you, you know, just to be on the safe side, you check some labs a week before you can check one a week after, especially if this is someone who's just been doing it once every three months or once a year or something like that, you know, and from the doctor perspective, I put my, my blinders on, it's just a blood test. I know it's a, it's a needle stick, but what, I mean, at this point, what's a blood test among friends? What's a blood test and in, in pissing into a cup at this point, right? So it's now if it's more significant, like open heart surgery, someone who needs, you know, an abdominal reconstruction. Uh, okay, I'm going to talk with the surgeon and hey, I know you want to kick them out the door the next day, but let's do this a little bit longer. And then I'm going to try to have that patient come back, you know, on Monday, 
and just be sure that things haven't gone sideways. I mean, there's no science to it. And, you know, I mean, I wouldn't want to do daily testing for like a month, but, you know, just to make sure around that time that they're fine going in and when they've come out, they're okay. Okay. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Safe during pregnancy? Yes. Okay. Yes. Are you planning on getting? No, I mean, we, I mean, it is now with all these medications to be, I mean, to be honest or to be open about it. Like it's not as though this ever, if you push me to a corner, doc, Dr. Imagine have this, have, do you have randomized prospective double blind placebo control trials in pregnancy? No. Oh my God. No. I mean, there is no way that would ever happen. Right. But we ask ourselves the question, like, what do we need to do to keep mom healthy? And if mom, if, it, if it's mom's decision to continue with the pregnancy, then this is what we need. This is what we would recommend. We give, we give rituximab, which is, it's an immunosuppressant chemotherapy. There are lots of medications that we can give. Do we know for sure? Is there 18 year follow-up data for all women who've been on ecolizumab and have been pregnant? No, no. I can't tell you what the SAT scores are going to be 18, 18 years from now, but yes, we would, we would give it and we have, and we do. Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. All right. So with these rare conditions, we know that we will, you know, we see pediatrics, we see adults, we see men, we see women. And right. This is a subpopulation of a rare disease are women who have gotten pregnant. And so that will be registry data. So like, you know, and it's as good as we can get. Right. The limitation with that is we only know when people put in the data, right? So if everyone who's had a great time says, oh, I had great, there's nothing, we're not going to see that. If someone had a horrific complication with it and they don't put that data in, we're never going to know. I mean, it's better than nothing, but it's, yeah, we'll take what we can get. Okay. In Canada, I think it was about, oof, I want to say it was almost 500, at least 200 patients. I can look at yeah. Sure. One thing I, one thing to keep in mind is when the testing was done, since we are finding new genes, um, you know, though that panel may need to be updated when they said, Hey, we didn't find anything. Was that because we just checked last week or was that five years ago? One of the other problems, one of the other challenges in the area for constant research is we're finding new things, right? There are now 9 billion of us and we find, right, we're going to find differences, right? And you see, you might see this term called a VUS. Well, they found this thing. What's a V? It's a variant of uncertain significance. What does that mean? <laughs> um, it's a very, it's of uncertain significance. Um, you tell me, right? I mean, un, un, you know, there, there are ways to figure out if this is pathogenic or not, but we're, I mean, and whether or not that's the other thing that we're finding out, right? It's more information that we're getting. And then how do we make that personal to a person? Okay. What's my time? Go get a potty break. Go get potty break, <laughs> drink break. Because Spiro's next. Uh, whose turn wasn't it? Whose turn was it to watch Spiro? Yes. Well, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. Why don't we take a break and we'll see, see you all in five minutes.